and years ago, I had the pleasure of getting to know a, a gentleman who probably was the first legitimate, what they call now, prepper. But Stan Deo is much more than a prepper. He is a journalist, a researcher, and a man who has spent a long time trying to wake people up to the fact that this planet is a planet in flux. If you go to his website, which is uh, really a terrific website, by the way, you'll see a lot of information uh, from freeze-dried food to, well, all kinds of things. You'll see it up there. And if you look above that, you'll see a horizontal nav bar menu. And you can click on Earth Changes, for example. And every day, it's updated. Stan and Holly run the website. And today, May 28th already, is, uh, again, uh, something that you can look at. It's updated May 15th. There's a lot happening. And when you look across that menu, it's a very wide and full discourse on the state of the planet, which is actually not very good, as we all well know. Let me just stop right here and, and say hello to Stan and, and welcome him back. How are you, Stan? Hey, good, Jeff. It, it's been, what, like nearly 10 years since we've uh, done a show together, I think. Seems like yesterday, but it has been about 10 years. 10 years. That means doesn't, you're... Doesn't it amaze you how quick it passes? Uh, uh, amaze is not the right word. I, that means you're 39 about, you must be 39 <laughs> by now. You're too kind. <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you, Jack Benny had it figured out. He knew. 39 was it, and you stop, and then you enjoy. And I want to tell you, the, the website looks terrific. I wasn't kidding. Well, uh, you know, Holly does all that. Um, well, well, most of it, I do the earthquake thing, but... Um, yeah. She uh, gets up at about 4.30, uh, six days a week, and... Uh, Start scouring the news uh, services all over the planet for stuff that uh, pertains to what we talk about in preparedness and uh, right. you know, prophecy and stuff like that. And well, you two, you two are quite a team, and you've been at it for a long time. And uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I should apologize. I don't know where ten years went. Honestly, I, I would have said maybe five or six, something like that. But it has been ten. Well, you're going to have to come on more often. This is, this oh, is I ridiculous. think it's been ten. It seemed like it. I, I yeah. asked Holly. We, we couldn't remember any. Couldn't I, I believe you're right, but there's so much going on. We really do need to hear uh, from you folks more often, if if that can be worked out. And I'd love to have you on. So we'll, sure, we'll sure. talk about that. When How we think were, when you're part of the world, there you get any uh, earthquakes or tremors or anything that you noticed recently? I don't really care about earthquakes. I lived in Santa Barbara for a long time and Southern Cal, and I know they never really bothered me. I just I'm not afraid of them. I don't know why. What bothers me, though, of course, is the radioactivity we're getting in the Pacific and in the moisture and in the and the rain fronts. They're not all hot, but Fukushima continues to uh, dump uh, 400 tons minimum, and that's admitted, of radioactive water, groundwater that is flowing into these uh, burned-out, melted-through reactors. Uh, they don't even know where the corium is on two of them. So this yep. water comes in, and the uh, the wise men of TEPCO pump it out into the ocean. Of course, they've been lying about this for over two years now. They put those uh, funky tanks up and filled them up in a matter of a couple, three months, and then lied about that. So it's all, uh, it's really a big, a big issue to me, and I, I continue to cover Fukushima because I do believe, without question, it is the most damaging catastrophe in recorded human history caused by humans. It's certainly going to affect a lot more people than Chernobyl did. Well, 60 million Japanese, that's by government admission. Well, you know, not only that, I've uh, seen some of the um, the studies of the water flow, the radiated water coming out of Fukushima, and surprisingly, a lot of it's crossing the equator and heading down toward Chile, the west coast of uh, South America. Nowhere to hide, Stan. There isn't. It, there really it, isn't. No, it's going all over the place. And this, is, this really has uh, far exceeded uh, Chernobyl. And no one's talking about it. I, I and Honestly, beside my site, I'm not sure what you guys are doing. I'm sure you're doing something on it. But there's no mention of it in the mainstream media, just like there's no mention of uh, the whole smart grid, uh, smart oh, meter yeah. crisis. That, that's out of the headlines now, too. And w when we last talked, uh, I don't know what, you, what you'd call it, but the, they, them, they have just put the pedal to the metal and the changes, it's like they got to a point of realization that there would be no viable pushback from the public, that they had the public well enough in hand that they were going to just roll it out 
And that's what they're doing. And the changes have been uh, phenomenal. I mean, just uh, unbelievable in the last 10 years. You know, I agree. Holly and I, for the last oh, two or three, have just been saying, you know, almost like you're breathless looking at the news every day and seeing how much they're taking away from us, just like a, an octopus, small direction. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Well, that's, that's the secret, as you well know, uh, to keep the uh, sheep confused. I guess I shouldn't... In- uh, insult sheep, we should call them some ants. <laughs> anyway, to keep them in, in a state of confusion, the idea of coming at them from all different directions is really the key. And that's what happens now. And the so-called news, we know how phony that is, nonetheless yep. is full of death and suffering and intrigue and crime and criminality and bombings and all the rest of it. And so how long do people really have to hold on to one thing before they hit with one or two others? Not long. And couple that with the attention span of the average sheep in this country. And it it ain't much, folks. It isn't much at all. So It's not. And I I tell you, you you've you've seen them herd sheep, uh, well, cattle the same way. But the, the sheep are probably dumber than cattle, though, and uh, they confuse them. They come at it from different directions. But generally, there's one hole where the sheep can run to, to a safe gate. And of course, that's where you load them up to take them to market or something. But uh, I see, as I, as I talked with you about what, 10 years ago, I guess, that there are several crisis curves that are really being uh, accelerated, like you're talking about crime, um, the economy, a threat of nuclear war, threat of, you know, well, it's not a threat that's happening, uh, food being polluted uh, by the Chernobyl, uh, sorry, by, the, by Fukushima. All these crisis curves are coming to a head right now. Mm-hmm. And we, the sheep, mm-hmm. are thinking, well, can somebody solve this? I mean, is there anybody out there that can help us, you know, solve the planet? And we're being herded right where we're supposed to, to be clamoring for the overthrow of all the bankers and the bad government. Let's have a new government and a a right. new economic system, and and you and I talk about this. I mean, it's it, it's happening quicker quicker than we thought, but you know, it is happening. Pavlov would uh, would laugh. He would <laughs> laugh. They uh, they ha- they really do have it. It's game set and match. They've got it down. They yeah. know exactly how much pushback there will or won't be, and it's usually there won't because of the amount of uh, input. Uh, this little pea brain collective consciousness that that exists here now just can't take it. And so it just it slops right past them. You know, uh, computers, the, the advent of supercomputers has really helped them get their act together. Because, they know. I mean, look at Facebook and all these social, uh, you know, networking things. It, it uh, lets them analyze with these supercomputers almost real time the entire world and saying, okay, what are they thinking? Where are they moving? How are they? What are they afraid of? Or are they paying attention? And the computer sitting there, you know, feeding data into some big mathematical model they've made. And, uh, you know, they know, well, if we push here, they're going to push back maybe over here, but nothing important. And they know all the places to push on us where we won't react enough to do any good as far as getting them out of office or away from power. You know, I want to I salute you because, honestly, I don't remember another guest coming on the program uh, initiating conversation about this computer duality that, uh, that we have here. We have the real world and we have the cyber world. And they have created, uh, essentially... Uh, as much as they want, a duplicate social, economic, political, military, geopolitical, geological duplicate of the planet. And they can feed any data they want, and they do feed in real time, I'm sure, around the clock, a stream of data into this computer, so they know when they want to introduce anything into the into the equation of idiots, that they can get a, a plus or minus one or two percent feedback immediately on what will happen. And with the guidance of the media, go back to Operation Northwoods, uh, dear friends. You remember that. If you don't, look it up. Because in the 1950s, the CIA was bragging that it could put any story it wanted in any major American newspaper within one hour. And that was in the 1950s. Where do you think they are now? Could there be a CIA or other intel asset in every major media outlet? You bet your bottom dollar there is. All right, hold on. We'll talk uh, more with Stan Deo in just a couple minutes. Do click on the website and visit Stan and Holly's. It's uh, it's terrific. The uh, idea of computers uh, is is so important now. Very few people, uh, whether they're sheep or intelligent folks, understand the war. There is literally a, a world war going on right now, World War Four. It's a cyber war. 
and it is going on 24-7. The Chinese, of course, are major players. So are the Americans. So are the Brits. So are the French. So are the Russians and other countries. But those are the big heavy hitters. They are attacking, probing, trying to disassemble each other's defenses around the clock. Remember years ago, Stan, the Chinese went into the very central computer control system of the American power grid and kind of left a calling card there on purpose. They, they kind of oh. laughed. Yeah. Uh, they're doing this all the time. I just got a story uh, that uh, the Australians are now worried about their national security being compromised by the Chinese and other foreign hackers. Here's two for our guys to worry about. They're right in the first news block at rents.com. U.S. weapons system compromised by Chinese hackers. And then the story right above it says, the Pentagon, the Chinese stole our newest weapons. Well, folks, the Chinese have a very old and storied history of stealing American technology, as you well know, Stan. Oh, I do. Painfully so. You, you can't you can't patent anything nowadays. You can put in a patent application, which I've done, uh, for an energy device, and if they refuse to give the patent on it, you know, uh, it just can't be at, at the patent office. And yet they turn right around and gave it to the Chinese. They, in fact, they gave it to the world. They published it still there on the on the patent thing as an application, which is supposed to shelve and not unreal. 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 I, mean, I mean, how do you unreal? How do you, how do you You'll finance something like See, that when your, your shareholders have no protection. Okay, and now I'm going to talk oh. more about, for those of you who don't know Stan's background, it's, it's quite unique. Uh, it qualifies him to talk about many things with authority. The Nixon administration, during that time, Fort Detrick, Maryland, our ultra above top secret bioweapons facility, was so full of Chinese scientists that the director, or one of the big high mucky mucks there, quit in protest. He said, when I go in to, to work, he said, there are often more foreign scientists, most of them Chinese there, than there are Americans. And they were all put in there by some, some kind of uh, exchange, alleged exchange program, open door program by Nixon. So this, is, this goes way back. The Chinese laugh. Uh, several years ago, there were a couple Chinese, at least one at Los Alamos, who was in, uh, allowed into very secret areas. They're stealing us blind. It's kind of like a Walmart over here. It's a joke. Tell folks about your background a little bit, Stan, and, and why you know so much about the whole defense industry. Well, uh, back in 71, I was recruited to, uh, when I was living in Dallas, or Kate outside of Dallas, I was recruited by Dr. Edward Teller's research group to go to Australia and work with their team down there on developing advanced technologies and propulsion like anti-gravity for saucer craft that they were building and various other things for submarine uh, craft. And I went so, down uh, there. Excuse me, i got to hold you. Don't lose your... When you went down there, you just mentioned Edward Teller, you mentioned anti-gravity, and you mentioned it with conviction and reality. So... If we're doing serious anti-gravity research, which the Germans were doing during World War II in the 70s, and you were involved with it, yeah, where might we be now? Well, the, when I was inducted into the program, it was because I was going to, to file a patent on a, a, a way to make a plasma or dynamic plasma flying saucer. I hadn't prepared the papers yet. I was thinking about it. I don't even know how they knew what I was doing at home in my lab. When they did induct me, <laughs> they, they know everything. <laughs> well, they do, and when they they showed me, you know, a lot of stuff, and and to my amazement, this is 1971. In, in the 50s, they'd already had uh, you know crude anti gravity, and they had built the craft I was going to patent. They built, tested, tried several of them, found the problems with it, went to the next step, uh, you know. So they wanted me to join, knowing that I'd already gotten to that that stage. That they were at 15, 20 years ahead of me. Uh, this, this is the amazing thing. Do they have anti-gravity? Oh, yeah. How much anti-gravity? How much super technology? That's the question. I mean, can they make a ship that's a mile in diameter and make it work and fly fast like it was a little craft, but, but a huge thing like that? Yes. Now, these things impress most of the engineers and physicists on the planet that say, well, look, it's impossible to support a craft like that, even if it were just a, a Boeing 707 or something. You can't hold it in the air for 10 minutes in stationary position. Just can't do it. And, of course, the argument comes back for me. It says, well, what about hot air balloons? They stay up a lot longer than that, you see, in one spot if you want to. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, of course, they say, well, that doesn't count. That's specific gravity. That, that, we, we write that out. 
but the technology is so advanced now, and I haven't been in the program since, oh gosh, the, the, uh, the mid-70s. So at that time, the stuff that I was told about or saw or worked on was so advanced that the, the average person on the planet that, that was told this would just say impossible. Impossible. Was this, der- was, was this derivative of uh, of crashed uh, technology, or do we come up with it on our own? Well, part of it, and part of it was working with these beings uh, that uh, that built those crashed craft you're talking about, and other craft as well. So we did make treaties with them, uh, contracts, and we did build uh, development uh, facilities underground and under uh, water, uh, you know, and under the South Pole, uh, that new Schwaben land where the Germans had been you know, during World War II and prior to that. And we did make technology and technology manufacturing facilities in jointly occupied basis with these uh, quote unquote alien beings. Mm-hmm. In the late 70s, after I had left the, the, the uh, operation, our bases had wars and battles, and we were kicked out of it. The beings that these alien beings, we'll just call them that, they arrived here short of technology and manufacturing processes, infrastructure. They needed to build weapons to fight against a a larger enemy uh, to them than than we are to them. And they needed us to build the infrastructure to start out, and once they got to the point where they could build everything they needed without us, they kicked us out of our bases. I mean, bang, 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 kicked us out. It was a a war. That was the late 70s. And after that, I don't know what happened. There were some fatalities involved, I hear. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> I mean, look, imagine these beings claim to have been here on Earth when we were created in the Garden of Eden thing. I mean, that's far back. And claim to have documents and, and videos and stuff like that to show us that they were there. And that technology 3,000 years ago, I mean, what have we done in 100 years? You know, the, from the horse to the, to the moon? 3,000 years at least? How can you fight technology like that? So they have, they essentially feel that they have a, a real estate deed that uh, supersedes us. Uh, Absolutely. We're Absolutely. just in- interlopers. Kind of like the Israelis on the West Bank, uh, or worse. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, just a second. This is fascinating. I want to follow this up with Stan in just a couple of minutes. We have to pause here. A little bit more about Ed Teller and what, uh, what he or may not have known or may have known back then. This is interesting. Hold on, gang. Right back. 